am Mitch Hensley, the Executive Secretary for the Scottish Rite in Arkansas. Uh, the Scottish Rite is a fraternal organization within the family of Freemasonry. Uh, it is an appendant body that men that belong to Freemasonry can choose to join if they, if they so choose. Um, uh, this building was built by the Scottish Rite. Uh, construction began 1921 and dedicated 1924, so we're closely coming upon our 100-year anniversary, which we're uh, planning a, a big celebration for. Um, uh, the building is still used for its original purposes of, of uh, fraternal usage and having fraternal events, initiating men into the fraternity, um, we, but we also rent the building out to the public now. Uh, since November of 2014, we've actively opened the building up to the public for nonprofit fundraisers, uh, lots of weddings, banquets, and um, by doing so, it accomplished two things that we really wanted to do. Uh, number one, um, kind of, uh, unveil Freemasonry a little bit more in Arkansas uh, uh, to really, to kind of get away from the stigma of uh, we're so secretive that nobody can be in here and uh, it's only for us and to share this building with the public because it's such a unique structure for Arkansas and of course the the uh, income from the rentals that we do help us uh, be better stewards of a 100-year-old fraternal building. Uh, while it does change a little bit from jurisdiction to jurisdiction, um, uh, the, the Masonic fraternity is open to men of all faiths. Uh, the, again, the prerequisites are slightly different from state to state or jurisdiction to jurisdiction with uh, in regards to age mostly. Sometimes it is 18 years old. A lot of times it is 21 years old. It is now 18 years old in Arkansas. Um, uh, a common prerequisite in any jurisdiction is a belief in a supreme being um, and the immortality of the soul. Um, uh, those are the only prere prerequisites for being a Mason. Um, uh, you do not have to be uh, a certain religion, you do not have to be a Christian, you don't have to be a Jew or a Muslim, but any of those are welcome in the fraternity and we meet and um, uh, uh, have cordial social discourse where otherwise you might not be able to. And that's, one of been, that's been one of the unique things about the fraternity is uh, it's one of the few places where men of differing backgrounds can get together and there be peace and harmony, um, uh, but there still are those differences, but the core beliefs are the same. Uh, Freemasonry is often uh, confused with being a religion because it is so spiritual, and, um, and uh, the, the degrees that we do, which are in every jurisdiction moral and theatrical plays that a man receives as an initiatory experience, um, uh, to become whatever level of a Mason that he's pursuing. Um, uh, and they're always morally and ethically charged in the content of the degrees, but they're not uh, religious in any way. Uh, there's no portion of Freemasonry that, that um, claims to have a uh, pathway to any sort of salvation. Uh, and in fact, whenever you're and in, in, in Arkansas particularly, whenever you're raised to be a master mason in a symbolic lodge, um, it is impressed upon you that this is an important step in uh, self-building of character, um, but that uh, the things of eternal salvation are found in other places and not in a Masonic lodge. But due to secrecy uh, throughout the decades and the centuries, uh, naturally, whenever there is secrecy, it, it, it welcomes uh, rumors and, uh, conspiracy. and conspiracy sure. theories about what is actually going on, which is, you know, understandable uh, sure. because a lot of people will use the, the claim of, well, if it's, sec if it's so good, you're not hiding anything, why is it secret? Uh, which is a reasonable question. Uh, but again, uh, the, the secrets of Freemasonry are are not 
on that um, uh, level of being ulterior or uh, maniacal in any way. Um, most of it has to do with a lot of tradition and uh, a lesson of if we're going to impart these lessons to you that we're going to say have some secrets in them and you can't keep that to yourself then our fraternal bond of ever placing anything of worth in your trust is probably not going to be safe. Uh, Freemasonry often talks about the safe repository of faithful breast of uh, talking to another brother and confiding in him either your problems uh, whatever it may be and so if you can't if you can't keep something a secret as a small portion of a uh, of a ceremony then maybe you can't be trusted with anything else so the secret really is the secret the secret a lot of times is the secret yeah um, uh, uh, the um, for a man that, that, that receives the degrees um, it, it can be enlightening it definitely is enlightening and it, and it, it, it opens up new understandings and um, uh, unlock some things if a man is already thinking about these spiritual questions or these um, uh, lessons and these legends from from biblical times even um, there's a little bit of context that's in there that kind of opens your eyes a little bit um, uh, but the but the interpretation is really open to the person receiving the degrees and that's why uh, a Muslim or a Jew or a Christian can receive the same degree and really take something else out of it. Some of the universal lessons of charity, um, uh, uh, something like that is not, you know, it's not open to interpretation. It's a lesson of charity. But there's other concepts that, uh, that the uh, Jew or the Christian or the Muslim may touch on in a different way. What about skilled trade? How does how do specific skilled trades um, fit into um, the Masonic system? Right. Well, fortunately, it doesn't anymore um, because so many of us, including myself, uh, uh, at least in the way of, of uh, actual stone masons, uh, the masonry got its uh, or origination in in the stone guilds, the craftsmen guilds of the ancient times of building churches in Europe and stuff like that. Um, and they were tradesmen, and they actually had uh, trade secrets that were um, uh, so valuable. Their their skill set was so valuable that it allowed them to earn wages that the average citizen could not earn because they did not know how to build an arch. That was that was unique technology. That was unique um, uh, uh, set of skills to be able to build some of these buildings and to build an arch or to build a bridge. And, and um, uh, they were able to prove themselves by, by certain signs and words and handshakes. And so that's why we do that today. It's a traditional thing. So if you could prove your your membership, right, um, you then could exchange the quote secrets of right. the trade. Right. So if um, if if you're traveling in uh, you know several several hundred years ago across Europe building cathedrals, and uh, the superintendent of this project uh, is looking to pay you a premium wage for cutting stone. They want to know that the wage that they're going to pay is is what they're actually going to get in return, and so at that time there were certain words, and most most commonly there were grips or handshakes that you could give that only a stonemason would know, and that was the way that you could prove if you hire me, I've proven to you who I am, I am worth these wages, and you'll be able to pay me this, and this is the product that you're going to get from me. And, and um, uh, as it began to evolve from the actual stonemason guilds into what they were operative masons, they actually built buildings, and then it, and then it evolved over time into a society. Uh, it, it evolved into speculative masonry, uh, which is what we are now today. We are speculative masons that use the symbols of working tools and buildings and stones 
and we use them as ways to um, uh, to portray a lesson, or oh, uh, like the rough ashlar and the perfect ashlar, uh, uh, or the common gavel, or the the 24 inch gauge about how to divide our time so that you have better time management. Um, uh, those are things that were used to actually build buildings, but today Masons say that we use them to build a better life. Uh, and so it's speculative masonry. And so that is the, that's the tradition where we come from. Uh, but as of today, um, you know, very few of, uh, of our members are actually uh, uh, qualified to, to work in that field. And so we have men that are um, uh, from every background now, uh, now that it is a, um, a fraternal society, speculative masonry, we have anything from uh, uh, executives of banks to uh, construction uh, superintendents to janitors to uh, school teachers and lawyers, um, uh, all looking for something in particular okay. in the fraternity. What do the different degrees confer in this area? So there's different lessons. Um, uh, it is a successive stage of receiving these degrees. Uh, and some of the organizations actually tie a numerical number to them and some of them don't. Um, uh, but they are usually successive in building upon the previous one. And all of them have a particular uh, message to convey, uh, um, uh, a lesson, or some precept of some kind that they're wanting to impress upon the individual that's receiving the degree, whether it be charity, whether it be um, uh, fraternal uh, uh, affection, brotherly love, uh, uh, community uh, uh, philosophy, deeper thinking, uh, whether it, it could be any number of things. Um, and each organization, uh, it, it very much differs. Uh, the, the York Rite or the Scottish Rite have very different paths to kind of get you to the same place, different backgrounds. If somebody was interested in joining, what, what is the procedure? What's the process? How would somebody get started uh, to become a Mason? Right, so the, the process is a little unique um, uh, because Masonry still doesn't actively promote membership. Um, it is still a, uh, a, a, a petition process. You have to ask to be a member. And that is why we have generationally um, lost several uh, sections of, of, uh, of uh, the years of men that just never joined because they, they believed my father was a Mason, his father was a Mason, and I'm just waiting on them to, to give me the invitation. You know, um, there, there, I don't know how many men I've met over the years that have told me, I always wanted to join and I was waiting for that invitation and it never came. And I always felt like, well, I just, I wasn't up to snuff. Um, yeah, I just didn't get the invitation because they didn't want me to be a member. And um, it is a very, um, long-standing unwritten rule in most jurisdictions that you do not ask any man ever to be a mason that is something that he comes and he asks for which is why our application uh, which is an application for membership it is called a petition and the the man has to come and ask for a petition um, and uh, and and it is uh, we are obligated as masons uh, no matter who the man is, no matter if, if we know the man personally and we believe that maybe he will not be a good Mason, we're obligated to give him a petition no matter what. Uh, uh, they, will, they will go from door to door. If somebody's like, I, I haven't had a petition and you know, I don't know where to get one. I don't even know who the secretary of my lodge is. I haven't been there in 20 years, but I'll find out and I'll get a petition for you. Um, but it's on the individual and, uh, and there's that the same way we talked about the secrecy, there's a lot of misconception about the secrecy. Uh, there's a lot of misconception about um, having to be asked to be a Mason. Uh, you're, if everybody is, is keeping the tradition and doing what they're supposed to do, you'll never be asked. Um, 
but they hope that someday maybe that you will ask and they'll be happy to help whenever that comes. So it is a, it's a different way of doing things and it obviously has its downside. Um, but uh, whenever a man uh, uh, decides that he has questions, of course, um, anyone's happy to ask or answer questions uh, these days. Uh, we've had past generations that were very, very quiet about the fraternity and, and felt like they couldn't answer any questions at all. And in fact, there's been relatives I know that have had um, uh, another relative die, uh, and, and, and it's just at the funeral that they find out he was a Mason. And he was a mason for 50 years, and he just didn't tell anybody. Um, uh, there's just other generations that were particularly quiet about it for some reason. Uh, uh, but it's becoming more open. Uh, people understand that there's almost anything that somebody can ask that they can't answer. You know, they can answer anything. Um, uh, but yeah, the man, the man needs to come and, and ask.